And so you are joining us today for our culminating event of the Barbara Bowman Leadership Fellows. Today we are going to be reimagining early childhood um, with a specific attention in this policy pitch to the early childhood workforce. Um, I'm Christina Passioni Zayas, the Associate Vice President of Policy at Erickson Institute. For those that are not familiar with the Early Childhood Leadership Academy at Erickson, we provide leaders with dynamic and collective learning experiences to enhance their capacity to influence early childhood policy, leading to positive outcomes for young children and families. Uh, this program could not be possible without the generous support of our funders, the Irving Harris Foundation and the Fields Foundation. And I want to also especially shout out because this program could not be possible without the leadership of Penny Smith our Associate Director of the Early Childhood Leadership Academy, and Hannah Corey, who serves as our Program Coordinator. Um, we are delighted to be presenting this culminating event for the Barbara Leadership Fellows, which you should see this gorgeous group of individuals who represent the movers and shakers in our field, the influencers on the ground who fully understand what rubber meets when rubber meets the road with policy, they're the ones tasked with implementing it. And named after one of Erickson's co-founders, Barbara T. Bowman um, is, is who we are honoring in this particular work. Her work as an advocate, as an educator, and as a policy expert. And this specific program is designed to enrich the perspective and enhance the capacity of diverse child advocates who are committed to advancing racial equity through early childhood policy. I'm gonna take you through the journey very quickly um, so that you kind of get a flavor of what the fellows have experienced over the past 10 months. We host 10 day long seminars. And in these seminars, we cover everything from content to um, policy to history to the research in the science and sometimes we interrogate that science specifically as it relates to racial equity and we are really delighted to be able to call upon our partners who are experts in the field of early childhood as well as the research um, we were lucky to have started the fellowship uh, pre-pandemic, so we had the value of being together in person for the first five months and then quickly transitioned to a virtual format the, the preceding five months. And here you are joining us for this virtual experience of the policy pitch. We also provide our fellows with coaches. Um, who represent experts in the field of early childhood or understanding the systems, the structures, the policies, the history. They really help to guide our fellows through the capstone experience that I'll be explaining in just a few minutes. We also have a networking kind of model. You know, the, the fellowship is a cohort model. We believe very deeply that adults are able to get the most out of an experience when they have um, an experience where they're building relationships with each other, leaning on each other's expertise. Um, and so there's a variety of ways that our fellows interact with each other besides the learning experience, as you can see in these photos. And then lastly, the fellowship is rooted in applied learning. Um, they have constructed a policy memo, um, which is a, roughly about four pages. It outlines the problem in the field, it substantiates that problem with the data and uh, digs down to the root cause to then generate recommendations that could make an impact in the field. And so this drafting of the memo um, is, not, is also accompanied with what you are going to witness today, which is a two minute pitch um, for them to make the case of, for their recommendations. And you know, you may ask, why would we task individuals who do not have experience uh, writing a memo? And the idea is that we actually have to say that these individuals, whether they had previous policy experience or not, they can certainly appreciate the complexity of understanding how what goes into making policy and how we may, need to at times reform it, revise it, um, or start all over. And they also bring to them a certain level of expertise and knowledge that is incredibly 
um, helpful in informing how we can operationalize policy. And so we thank you for joining us today. And also we hope that you are able to um, bear with us if there's any technical difficulties. We've never done a virtual policy pitch. Um, so we are enjoying learning about all the intricacies of this. And so what I want to give you all is some logistical breakdown in terms of what to expect. Um, the panels of fellows that are going to be presenting, they pre-recorded their two-minute pitch. And we've organized them by general themes, these four particular areas where the bullets are. Each fellow's memo was reviewed by two to three judges, and those judges recorded their um, response to the memo as well as the response to the fellow's pitch. Um, but what we will only be watching today is one of the judges' responses due to time constraints. Um, there will be, uh, after the judge makes their um, response, there will be a live response from the fellow responding to the judge's um, feedback, not only the one in the video, but the one also that had provided feedback um, in a written form and also a video, but not all of them are being shown today. We want you to open up your chat box so that you can enter any questions that you may have because we're going to reserve um, a minute or two for our fellows to respond to those questions. We also want you to open up the participant list so that you can see there is a quick poll at the bottom bar there. And we're gonna ask you after each fellow's pitch and the judge's um, response, as well as the fellow's live response, could you support this recommendation? Um, and so you'll click yes if you do. Um, if you still have questions, might ha need more information, we're gonna ask you to click the icon that you will hit, it's the icon that says more, and there'll be a little coffee cup and it, it, it literally means I need to take a break, but it means that you need some more information. You need to sip your coffee and think about it a little bit more to see if you might be able to support it. So click that if it's a maybe and click no if it's something that you really couldn't support. This is our, our way to kind of get a pulse of how people are looking at um, our fellows recommendations. Um, we also ask that you stay muted. Um, I've asked everybody to turn off their videos. Um, Myself and um, Penny Smith will keep our videos on as we are going to kind of move us through. And what you'll see in terms of how this is going to flow, two minutes each for each of these segments. The fellow will introduce themselves the, and, and the pitch will run. The judge will give a response that has been previously recorded. The fellow will do the live uh, response and then there will be the audience Q&A and we will move right along to the next person. So buckle up, fasten your seatbelts for this marketplace of ideas and I am going to hand it over to Penny Smith. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, let's call to the stage John Barrero. Hello um, and welcome. My name is John Barrero and I'm the the Executive Director for the Collaboration for Early Childhood in Oak Park. It's a pleasure for me to be here to start us off today. This is a story about a young boy who is hopeful, curious, inquisitive, and Black. Because he is a Black boy, he won't find many role models or people who can mentor him. Starting in preschool, he will be suspended at more than twice the rate of his peers, disciplined more severely than others for the same behavior, and removed from classrooms more than any other children. He will feel as if no one understands him, he isn't valuable, and he doesn't belong. He won't have the life-affirming moments that prepare others for success. And after years of not belonging, a justice system that swallows Black men whole will welcome him. It'll be the biggest sign so far that his life doesn't matter. And we have already seen where that leads. This is the preschool to prison pipeline. But what if we have the opportunity to disrupt this cycle? In Illinois, the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act made a way for men to be freed and have their records wiped clean. Now these men wait for a new beginning. What if we capitalized on that new opportunity and offered these men lots of support, removed barriers to schooling, and prepared them to reenter the workforce in early childhood? where everything started to go wrong. But this time, as a teacher, 
Well, we've already allocated funding for their reentry into society. The state of Illinois can provide incentives for city colleges of Chicago to create accelerated programs for men to meet Illinois state preschool licensure requirements in the time frame in which their criminal records are being expunged. This will allow them to pursue careers in early childhood that were previously unavailable to them. For $15,000, a, newly, a newly released man can pursue a degree at one of Chicago's city colleges. A $15 million investment would offer a thousand men a chance every year to pursue a career that could change their lives, as well as the lives of black boys in classrooms across the state. And in one historical move, we could change that old story about the future of black boys in Illinois. Now, what would that be like? Hi, John, it's Kathy Main. Thank you for letting me review your policy brief and read your policy pitch. Um, the first thing I gotta say to you is, uh, I love your opening story. I think the thread that you tried to draw between feeling like no one understands me and not belonging um, could eventually lead up to a sense that life doesn't matter much is incredibly powerful. And I think while the brief is very well written and the research is compelling too, that line that you're starting to draw is important to keep bringing out to grab your audiences in. Um, the solution then that you sort of offer here um, to support these young uh, black preschool children, which is to have more black teachers, um, is a great solution. And it's one that's been around for, I think, a while. But what we've always struggled with was, but how? And I think that how is, you know, mixed up in our societal biases that we have that taking care of young children is essentially women's work. So your attempt to make a recommendation around the how is, is really important and commendable here. Um, and your choice of a specific group, which is black men incarcerated for low level marijuana offenses, is especially important for two reasons, because they have likely suffered injustices and you also weave in that there's existing legislation and a related program that could help support this uh, along the way. I personally am, in completely grabbed by the title, Prison to uh, Preschool Pi uh, Pipeline. It gets me, um, I feel it. Um, but I also encourage you to look at some of other programs that have tried to do this, have different kinds of names, like the Call Me Mister program at UIC and the Men of Color and Education project that uh, Dr. Jackson is running at Truman. Um, but the whole point is, I think you're onto something that's critical, is people who have faced an injustice in their life want to now be about helping others not face those same injustices. I think if we frame early childhood as a social justice issue, instead of an issue around taking care of little children, which is traditionally how we have done it, we have the potential to attract and retain young black men in the field, and we can say, having an impact in your community and being able to make change at a foundational level. So I'm very excited for the support that I've received with the pitch so far. It's, it's very heartening. And I've heard a few themes come up that I thought I would share and respond. Um, for, for one, my lens is education and my focus is always on young children, but, but, I, but I'm hearing that, that a holistic approach is really um, hey, Quinn, uh, is really required here. I think we want to, we need to look at a whole person situation so that it's, uh, we're not just thinking about their education and their, and their employment, but we're looking at their health, their emotional health, um, their housing, their connection to their community. We're treating a whole person. So after, beyond looking at a person holistically, we're also looking at how we can tailor to the needs of each person so that we don't have one response or one answer for each person, but that we have a variety of responses. And finally, that, that the way we respond and the way we act and activate ourselves be something that is community-led, based in, in people's communities, where we build community capacity and put people back in their community. So although my pitch was on education, I think there's a lot more to it. Why did I choose education? Because I think education is a tool of activism. And I think when we educate someone, we free them. When we educate a head of household, we free their family for generations to come. And I think this is how we move our community forward and change this narrative. Great, thank you. Um, so right now we're gonna ask the audience for a quick poll. Can you use the go to the participants uh, button and choose yes or no, or 
take a break as a maybe if you could support this recommendation. We'll take just a second to do that. Thank you. Okay. And then we'll take an, thank you all. We'll take a question from the audience. Uh, we've got Lisa Janae asking, how would you suggest that we reach out to the eligible men? Well, I, I think, I, I, Lisa, I think that's a great question. I think, I think part of what we want to do is we want to change the narrative. So I think um, um, part of reaching out to men is making, creating a culture, creating an environment where these men can be received and be welcomed. Um, I think it, there's a narrative that we have in our society that places a label on these people before they ever do anything. And I'm really well familiar with this. It's not an accident that I wrote this memo. I, I, as, a, as an adult Latino male, I know very well what it's like to walk into a room and to have someone see, have a label on you, to walk into a store, to walk into your guidance counselor's office, to walk into a classroom and people think that you are um, uh, someone to be afraid of. I think, so I think the first step before, before reaching out is looking at how we as a society develop a single story, a single narrative for these men, to open up our minds to what these men can be, to look at their potential, to, to look at the fact that we're talking about men with low level cannabis possession, with, um, with no violent um, history, that these can be people who can um, change and move within the society. I think it's putting that messaging out. It's, it's making sure that we, that we live by that messaging. I think we've all, we're all a part of what's happening in our community right now with the social unrest that's happening. We've all listened to um, the, uh, the words that come out of Black Lives Matter movement and we know, um, and we've all listened and, and felt for it and wanted something to do. So I think, I think what I wanna say in response to that is, here's what you can do. We can start to look at early childhood as an area of focus. We can look at these men and, and the role that they can play in that. And we can create, create a pathway for them to be useful, to be active, to be valued. I think once we've established our community that, that values them, I think, I think reaching them will be, will be, um, will be evident. It'll be the least of our problems it, because there'll be a place for them to be. They'll be part of our community. I don't think they're there right now. But I think, I think there's a lot of work for us to do amongst ourselves in how we develop this narrative before we, before we invite or reach out to them. I think that's what my first step would be. Thank you, John. Sure. And thank you for all your comments. We're actually going to track all of this and you guys can see what everybody's thoughts are when we post. So please keep the questions and the comments coming. Um, next to the stage, we've got Melissa. You're muted. Hi, Melissa Castile, Director of Assessment at the McCormick Center for Early Childhood Leadership at National Lewis University. You've heard the story of the young man told he couldn't graduate unless he cut his locks or the preschooler expelled because he was aggressive, or the many students disciplined because they were out of uniform. Detrimental policy decisions are made as a result of not having diversity at the policy table. Systematic factors have contributed to the lack of diversity. The 1954 Brown decision had the unintended consequence of removing black administrators. When white superintendents refused to put black principals in positions of authority over white teachers or students. In the words of Professor Leslie Fenwick, we decimated the black principal and teacher pipeline and we've never rectified that. As the diversity of early childhood students in Illinois schools increased, so does the need for ethnically and linguistically diverse administrators with strong early childhood backgrounds. Representation matters. Students and teachers need to see administrators that look like them and come from their communities. Now is the time for change. To increase the amount of Black and Latina early childhood administrators, educators need to see a clear pathway for career advancement, increasing their earning potential, and having a seat at the policy table. 
I recommend an intentional and supportive pathway for licensed teachers to obtain a master's degree and principal's endorsement. Through an Early Childhood Administrators Academy, a cohort model will include supports for educators to persist while removing barriers. Outcomes of the academy will include leaders with a cultural understanding of the students they serve, who can recruit, mentor, and support re retention of diverse teachers, and serve as higher ed early childhood faculty, as well as diversity of thought at the early childhood systems development table. Illinois can take the lead in developing innovative ways to strengthen and diversify the early childhood administrator pipeline. Hi, Melissa. Yes, representation does matter. And thank you for your policy pitch that addressed that. I enjoyed reading it. And I enjoy the fact that I don't enjoy the fact, but I'll just say thank you for pointing out the fact that we need to do something to strengthen and diversify the early childhood administration pipeline. I also found it interesting that your research pointed out that long ago we disseminated the black teacher and principal pipeline. So suggesting that we need to address pathways for career advancement, increases in earning potential, as well as making sure that people of color have a seat at the policy table are going to remain important. An Academy for ECE Administrators cohort is an excellent idea and I agree that it also supports the issue that you're trying to address. As I was reading through your policy, one of the things that stood out to me is the question of feasibility. Although I think that your next steps are clear, I question the feasibility because I think that it relies heavily on multiple governing and regulatory bodies coming to an agreement for the common cause. So as you try to move this forward, I would suggest that you think about ways to address that. But overall, I do recommend this policy and I thank you for the hard work. Thank you judges for your thoughtful feedback. To address your questions, ISVE would be responsible for both the oversight of the principal endorsement and program approvals for institutes of higher ed who um, would offer an endorsement and a degree through this academy. And yes, yeah, center directors are really important to this pathway discussion as well. And they were originally included, um, however, there was a need to narrow the focus of this degree. And building a bridge from center director requirements to ISB principal endorsement would require much broader systems change. And uh, superintendents should be motivated to recruit early childhood educators, which was another question. ECE is known as the whole child, whole family community partnership approach. And the Hunt Institute recently used Maslow before Bloom to describe benefits of the ECE perspective, where basic needs, including psychological safety, are foundational. Many early childhood educators have skills, knowledge, and values at the core of their practice that provide an important grounding for administrators of any age, including but not limited to understanding of the physical and mental well-being of children and families, knowledge of strong relationships with children and adults are fundamental to learning. The importance of executive functions, small strong interpersonal skills, attentiveness to interactions and environment, in addition to human growth and development and curriculum implementation. Superintendents should definitely jump on the opportunity to hire these administrators. Representation matters. I'm grateful to ECLA for the opportunity to share my policy brief with you. Thank you. Great. Okay, if we can get uh, the audience to vote on if they could see themselves supporting this. Remember under participants, yes, no, or take a break for maybe is what we'll use. So we can do a quick tally of that. And I'm looking for questions. Oh, so we'll do a comment on this since I don't see a question here yet. Going kind of fast. Uh, Antoinette says, Melissa, perhaps we can call you a prophetess moving forward. Just Wednesday night, I was a part of a, a legislative planning meeting. A large part of our conversation was your topic. Everyone was in agreement that this is a must. 
we will have some follow-up meetings to determine how to move this forward. Great start to a needed conversation. Thank you for sharing that, Antoinette. Okay. Do we have any questions in there? All right. Then we'll move forward because it looks like you answered this one already. What entity or entities will be charged with this change? And you mentioned uh, ISB. Did you have any others that you wanted to add to that? Or are you good? Okay. Thank you. All right, so now let's call to the stage, Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Callantine and I am the Associate Director of Early Childhood at Christopher House. I would like to share the story of Cynthia. Cynthia is a passionate, highly qualified teacher and the first teacher to win Employee of the Year at Christopher House. Cynthia is currently enrolled in a cohort program working on her bachelor's degree and professional educator's license in order to have the ability to take a lead teacher position. However, this has not been an easy process. While working to complete her program, Cynthia has had three different advisors, has had to navigate the transfer of credits process send countless emails to ensure she's on track with all requirements on top of working full time. Cynthia, a bilingual Latina teacher is representative of the children and families that she is serving. This representation matters. However, this alignment is not the reality in all early childhood classrooms. According to the 2016 American Community Survey, just 11% of teachers in the city of Chicago are Latinx and 15% of teachers are black. Racial and cultural diversity is underrepresented in teaching positions that require higher qualifications. 90%, 90% of all Illinois Preschool for All teachers, the position that requires the professional educator's license are white. Many black and brown teachers that make up the early childhood workforce face systemic barriers to earning degrees, such as being first generation college students who live at or below the poverty line or being non-native English speakers who may struggle with the academic demands of classes conducted in English. It is time to ensure that teachers do not have to navigate these complex systems on their own. Structured partnerships between both two and four year higher education programs and early childhood programs to develop job embedded coaching can provide teachers with the individualized support needed to successfully complete a degree. Now is the time to ensure that equity-based job embedded coaching is in place so that teachers like Cynthia continue to advance and strengthen the early childhood workforce in Illinois. Sarah, thank you for the opportunity to read and listen to your excellent policy proposal. You have um, made an incredibly compelling data-based case for the severe underrepresentation of um, teachers of color among those educators who hold the professional educator's license in the state of Illinois. And you have clearly described the kinds of higher education pathway issues that um, contribute to the, the challenges in resolving this issue. I appreciated as well your use of a very clear story, a case in sharing the experiences of Cynthia in your policy video. As you move this into an action plan and pursue next steps, um, I think it will be really important for you to more fully develop the kinds of skills and competencies that you anticipate job embedded coaches would need to successfully support candidates um, to completion of the professional educator license. You know they will need specialized um, knowledge about adult learning, and that's certainly key, um, but would encourage you to further develop the, the kinds of skills you expect of a job-embedded coach 
if you have evidence of the kinds of outcomes where job embedded coaching has been successfully used, that would be helpful. And I'd also like you to think a little bit more about how you might address the FERPA privacy issues about having a job embedded coach interact with a college advisor. Those are some substantial issues you'll want to address. Thank you. So thank you to the um, feedback from both of the judges. I wanted to specifically address some of the pieces. Um, one is related to the idea of where we've seen uh, job embedded coaching be successful. And I did not include that in my policy memo um, due to constraints, but we've seen job embedded coaching specifically in the education field have incredible success when we look at the ability to individualize for specific teachers based on instructional supports and different topic areas related to professional development. So that is really the research that I was drawing from in making the recommendation for the job embedded coaching. Um, there are also competencies and skills that we would need to flush out um, in further preparation, but there are definitely parallels already with the work that has been done in other job embedded coaching that we would be pulling from. Um, the other piece that was mentioned was about the, the FERPA Privacy Act, and that is something I, I'm, not, I'm not looked into yet, but that would definitely be something we would take into account um, in moving this forward. Um, so that's the feedback for the coaches, or from the judges. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so we'll take a question. Well, actually, let's vote first. Can everybody vote yes, no, or maybe? If they could see themselves supporting this recommendation. Okay, and the chat is moving fast. So I'm going to read uh, Kate Connor's question. Wonderful, Hi, higher ed must face our role in creating, contribute, reinforcing this issue. How do we overprivilege individuals like Cynthia in this higher ed system? How do we dig into the challenges in higher ed in supporting the workforce in their academic goals? That was a profound question. Let's see. I mean, I, I think it's going to come down to strong partnerships. I think there have already been many um, opportunities for partnerships with cohort models and things like that. But I think it's that communication piece between the community-based organizations and institutions of higher ed. That's really where we're looking for continued collaboration and communication. Great. Okay. So then next up, we've got, uh, let's see who's next, Mark. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Barrett. I'm the Vice President of Early Learning Programs at Illinois Action for Children. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to share a story about Gloria. Gloria is a teacher in a preschool classroom. She has been a part of the early childhood workforce for more than five years. She's very ded dedicated to her work and passionate about the children she teaches daily. She's finding it difficult to continue as a career because of the low wages and has taken up a second job to make ends meet. The 2018 Early Childhood Workforce Index completed by the Center for the Study of Childcare Employment at UC Berkeley found that 50% of Illinois early childhood educators are currently receiving public aid supports such as TANF, Medicaid, SNAP, etc. Gloria is in that 50%. And the stress caused by the low wages reflects the current trend in our state of workforce instability, shortages, and inconsistent quality, all which impact the continuity of care for young children zero to five. 
so we don't use Gloria and many others like her. There needs to be a significant investment in the early childhood system. My recommendation is for the state to accept and implement all the recommendations provided by the current Early Childhood Funding Commission. I believe if these are accepted and implemented, the outcomes would be highly competent and professional workforce, fairly compensated, positive early childhood experiences for children zero to five, and the ability for the workforce to build positive relationships for those children who they work with daily. Thank you. Mark, I support your recommendation to follow the lead of other states that have invested in compensation strategies. I know you've mentioned Washington's creation of a unified wage scale for educators, regardless of which funding stream they are receiving to pay their wages. I also support what you've mentioned around longer term compensation strategies that can focus on supporting educators in attaining additional degrees and credentials as a means of moving them into a higher wage bracket or a higher paying position. What I would have liked to see a little bit more of in your presentation and in your memo, though, would be a direct connection between the systems issues that are being reviewed by groups like the Early Childhood Funding Commission and educator compensation. It can be really tricky to tie public policy to something like a wage change, which is usually set by an individual provider or the market at large. And so what can be beneficial is making clear, concrete connections between how specific higher level policies will directly lead to or influence providers' decisions on how much they can pay educators or how they're structuring their wage policies. Um, I also really would have liked to see more in the policy presentation and the memo, um, some discussion around the historical context behind low wages for early childhood educators. The truth is that only a few decades ago, women were largely caring for young children in their homes for free or at very low wages for others. And the labor of women, and especially women of color, in caring for children was and continues to be valued less by society, even while our knowledge of early childhood brain science continues to expand and grow. Any conversation about early childhood educator compensation is a conversation about our values in society in these areas. Overall, though, I think you wrote a really strong policy memo, and it was coupled with a strong presentation of a story that you knew well and that you brought to life around an early childhood educator and the immediate impact that compensation has on her well-being and her ability to remain in a job that she enjoys. It's these type of stories that policymakers can grab onto and use as they're thinking about crafting policy solutions that can work for educators across the field. Bethany and Elliot for your critical feedback and I have some responses to your um, specific, specific questions. The work of the current Early Childhood Funding uh, Commission and increasing compensation for early childhood educators has a direct connection. One of the goals of the commission is to develop a system designed for stability and sustainability. This includes salary schedules built on pay parity for similarly degreed positions. Even though the Washington State's compensation policies for early learning educators that I referenced in my policy memo, it's important to highlight that their policies specifically seek to close the wage gaps in the context of race and ethnicity, setting, district, and gender. Additionally, their policy, policy approach to compensation addresses both wages and benefits as part of any initiatives. Additional actionable policies were recently proposed in the, in the compensation consensus statement published by the Illinois Op Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. And some of these included incorporating compensation in the early childhood contracts, such as CCAP and the early childhood block, block grant, as well as integrating compensation into Accelerate. A per pervasive roadblock to this compensation issue is the public perception of the work. On the list of professionals from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, early childhood educators rank right between laundry and dry cleaning workers and parking lot attendants. Despite our new appreciation for early childhood educators, since many of us are experiencing homeschooling, they remain seriously underpaid for the work they do. 
Ultimately, for compensation parity to be achieved in Illinois, it requires the, legislator, the legislators to define the work of early childhood education as one worthy of the same pay as K-12, and then to appropriate the funding to support it. Thank you. Okay, can we get the audience to uh, vote, please? Do you see yourself supporting this recommendation? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. All right, so I'm looking for questions. Okay, we have from Lisa, have you thought about trying, tying this into conversations about graduated income tax and also property tax realignment? Yes, there has been conversations um, during my research as part of this, um, this process. Um, for this to be successful, there will need to be a combination of um, public and private partnerships to support this and fund these initiatives. Um, there will be obviously pushback because uh, taxes are a hot button issue. But I think if we continue to show that early investments in early childhood has long term benefits, it's actually um, lowers the cost long term for children who grow into adult, as you can see how it reflects in the criminal justice system with um, completing high school and, and other indicators that you will get more public buy-in. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Now let's call Shelly to the stage. Good afternoon, I'm Shelley Brimberic Lambert and I'm the Chief Reimagination Officer at the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. I'd like to introduce you to someone who has inspired me to reimagine how we support the largest sector of early care and education workforce, home-based childcare providers. Mrs. Baker is a home-based childcare provider. She's been a staple in the Austin community for 28 years. In that community, she fulfills the role of educator, counselor, and mentor. According to information gathered by Childcare Aware, home-based childcare providers like Mrs. Baker on average make $25,000 a year. This can be as little as $9.50 an hour when you factor in the hours that they provide care the paperwork they need to complete for multiple funding sources and various other responsibilities. Home-based childcare providers ensure that many communities that have been identified as childcare deserts have affordable care options. They also ensure that there is representation of the children in those communities through their caregivers. Home-based childcare was also the group of providers that most easily pivoted during our recent pandemic to provide care for essential workers during this time. One low cost, high return option to support home-based childcare providers is through building a network through the Child Care Resource and Referral System here in Illinois. A network model would support these home-based childcare providers like Mrs. Baker in increasing the level of quality they provide to our children and ensuring that they had a sustainable business model. Now is not the time to go back to the way things were, but to reimagine how we support home-based childcare providers through a network model. This is not only an important issue for childcare and for families, but it's also an important issue for employers as we look to rebuild our economy. Thank you. Hi, Shelley. The problem you've identified is a steady decline in the number of home-based childcare providers. Your paper is correct in pointing out that every time we increase quality standards, we reduce the supply of family childcare providers. 
you cite obstacles to quality improvement, including that many providers see their work as short-term help for a family, or providers work such long hours there's no time for training, and that providers may not lack needed business skills. Your policy proposal is to address these problems by developing family child care networks. You suggest that networks could tailor training to providers' schedules, assume some of the burden of billing and business management, and foster ongoing supportive relationships among providers. Shelley, I support your proposal to build family child care networks. In fact, the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Funding has received federal funding to pilot an approach that could include networks. In order to move your proposal forward, I need some more information. As you point out, our CCR and our agencies already provide many of these services. Why then are more providers not seeking higher accelerated circles? Is the funding inadequate? Are the standards not well designed? Uh, or is the support system unfocused? All are true to, true to some extent, but what new theory of change should we test and what results should we expect? And after answering these questions, we need to develop a clearly defined network model. The good news is people have been working on this. Juliet Bromer at Erickson is our national expert. And I invite you to follow the work of the Accelerate Subcommittee of the Early Learning Council as we discuss family child care. Thank you to my judges for your insight. You clearly outlined that there are several areas to be considered as we look at a designing a network model for home-based child care providers. Funding, as you spoke about, is it adequate? Accelerate. Also, is the support system unfocused? I'd like to start there. I do believe that the support system could use more focus. When I was doing my research for my policy memo, one article discussed several areas that can negatively impact the network model. One of those areas was poor preparation and training of the support staff and large caseloads. I think as we design an effective network model, we need to keep this in the forefront. We also have to look to other systems such as the home visiting model for best practices. The support staff is key to this network model. They have to be skilled communicators that can ask open-ended questions and provide reflective supervision. This support staff has to be knowledgeable and trained to be able to support not only the programmatic and educational components to impact quality, but they also have to be equipped to provide business and administrative coaching to support the sustainability for the providers. When we look to caseload, it needs to be a caseload that would allow for the support team to be out in the home child care providers environment, to get to know them, see where they are in their journey, what are their unique opportunities? What are the strengths that they bring to that community that could be leveraged in their individual sustainability plan? How can the provider plan help to be based in continuous improvement? And how can we make sure that we have an eye to identifying potential emerging leaders from this network that could help support this work? In regards to funding, I think there's some several things to consider. I do think we need enhanced and more flexibility with funding sources that are currently used to support this work. But I think we should also look to funding sources such as the funding for small business development centers to support this work as these home-based childcare providers are micro entrepreneurs. I welcome additional dialogue and consideration as we think about how do we support this very vital component of the early childhood ecosystem we saw through the recent pandemic how important home-based childcare really are to our communities and to the ability of our economy to recover. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Well, can we get the audience to vote yes, no, or maybe to her recommendation? And while you're doing that, uh, Terry was asking, are you talking about licensed and licensed exempt providers? And then I'm also going to read Claire's uh, comment that I like for you to speak on. Another area of concern for quality in FCC homes is the tendency to use assessment and curricula tools, as well as space layout and family engagement approaches that are designed for center-based work. Do you have any thoughts on that? So 
to the, the first question, I do believe when we look at um, home-based childcare, we need to look at all aspects of it. And each of them has its unique nuances. I think when we're looking about how do we look at uh, assessing the quality in the home-based, I think we really have to take a look at the relationship aspects. There's so many values in home-based childcare that get overlooked because we look at it in the lens that has been designed for centers. You know, there's clear um, ability for the continuum of care that you get in a home-based childcare provider setting. I think we saw through the pandemic, that was a group of providers that were able to easily pivot to provide care for essential workers. So I think that through this network model, I'm hoping we can lift up the voice of home-based childcare providers in a collective voice to help have the programs be designed specifically for the type of care they provide and not try to put a square peg in a round hole and use center-based tools. Thanks, Shelly. Okay, next up we have Peter. My name is Peter Leonard. I'm the director of student assessment at Chicago Public Schools. Imagine a student enters the school district in kindergarten, and after four years of classroom instruction from talented and caring educators, is not able to read on grade level. It's unfortunately not hard to imagine because it's all too common. It happens much more frequently for students of color. In Chicago public schools, Black and Latinx students account for 82.5% of the CPS student population. Only one third of these students meet or exceed third grade English language arts standards, less than half the rate of their white peers. And research demonstrates that these early literacy opportunity and achievement gaps can have significant impact on students' long-term trajectories. Chicago Public Schools, the third largest district in the country, is not effectively eliminating the barriers to success that will enable all students to learn to read by third grade. Third grade is too late to know that students are behind. Monitoring the early literacy development of students is critical to ensuring they are mastering the foundational skills needed to become successful readers and writers. It is even more important now due to the predicted learning loss impacts of COVID-19. In CPS, the kindergarten through second grade literacy assessments used by schools vary. Implementation of these tests has been inconsistent and schools change assessments frequently. Without consistent high quality information about how well students are learning, the district and schools are unable to respond effectively to address student learning needs. CPS should pursue a comprehensive strategy to address early literacy achievement gaps with assessments as a core component. CPS should adopt and administer a common research-based K-2 literacy assessment program across the district and provide comprehensive professional development to teachers and school leaders. As a result of the strategy, CPS will live up to its mission and make it hard to imagine that a student who enters the system in kindergarten would not be able to read by third grade. Hi, Peter. You presented your problem in a clear and concise manner. Your intro made me want to hear more. I agree that there are barriers that are preventing children from reaching third grade literacy benchmarks. Whereas I feel a consistent assessment throughout CPS would be beneficial. I'm not convinced that that is the sole reason for children not meeting third grade benchmarks. I do agree with the research that supports the fact that children who are not meeting third grade literacy levels seldom, if ever, catch up. I would be more inclined to support this recommendation if it addressed the importance of all children having ex access to high quality early childhood programs, such as a preschool for all or Head Start program that will set the foundation for them to develop their literacy skills prior to entering kindergarten. Then they would enter kindergarten more ready to learn. If your recommendation included the importance of 
access to early childhood development programs for all children, along with ensuring the assessment tools are equitable for children of color while addressing the need for continued professional development for teachers, I will fully support your recommendation. Peter, you want to respond? Needed to get unmuted. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Carissa Hurley and Elliot Regenstein for their really thoughtful feedback. Uh, my first reflection is on Carissa's comment around the focus in pre-K, absolutely in Chicago public schools. Uh, it is a critical piece of our CPS mission success starts here to expand pre-K services district-wide. Um, that includes expanded access, increased quality, partnerships and talent strategy and my colleague and fellow cohort mate Leslie McKinley I'm sure will be speaking more to that uh, and really leading a lot of that work. Uh, the work in K2 is around connecting that coherence from what we get in early days in UPK connected to our kindergarten assessment with kids, which is CPS vision goal, uh, and allowing all educators to have access to consistent quality information that allows them to respond effectively to students. If three CPS values are academic excellence, equity, and continuous learning, our assessments are one piece that allows us to learn and get better at scale and respond to the needs of, of our students. The last thing I'll say is that Elliot has pushed me in my next steps to go deeper on some of the root causes, which will lead into future explorations around contract status, collective bargaining, uh, and district disposition towards which components should be led at a district level and which components of our strategies uh, should include school choice. But overall, the core idea is that assessment information is how we can see students. It helps us empower our students, our educators, to understand where students are and where they can go. And we know that intervening in the earliest years can change a student's trajectory. And at the system level, we hope to deliver that for every student in Chicago, which is our mission and our responsibility. Thank you. Can we get the audience to vote, please? Yes, no, maybe. Do you see yourself supporting this recommendation? And Peter, we have a question for you. Uh, Peter, since you are currently working in a position at District 299 CPS, what if, what if anything have you done or could you do, for, do to further this conversation and maybe let your policy pitch be a pilot within CPS that the rest of the state can learn from. Thank you for the question, Antoinette. Uh, so there are a number of working groups in Chicago public schools that are really focused on helping to deliver on our key vision and mission strategies. Uh, so there are two main places that come to mind immediately. One is our universal pre-K working group, and the other is our early literacy collaborative that is committed to uh, reducing the inequities and early literacy outcomes by third grade with a special focus on our African-American Latinx students. There is a specific assessments subgroup of that team. And we're currently working in our early literacy collaborative strategic planning to identify some of the key lessons that the district can pull to help advance this goal at scale. Um, I've been discussing with that group these ideas around assessment and we'll be leveraging the policy memo, the process, your feedback and the feedback of the judges uh, to bring that learning to that group uh, so that we can explore how it can be incorporated in the full district strategy. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Next up, we have Deanna. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Diana McLaren. I am the Director of Grantee Support Services at the Anso Correction.
As a site manager in an early childhood community-based program, you have been looking for five months to hire a new lead teacher for the preschool classroom. The classroom has 17 children. Four children have diagnosed disabilities, and two children are newly immigrants and do not speak English. You hire temporary staff to cover the classroom during this time. You invested a lot of money and time looking for the right candidate. You HR manager found the perfect lead teacher for the preschool classroom. But what about this new lead teacher? Will she be equally excited? The new lead teacher arrives to your side and on her first day, she learns that she has to become familiar with policies, regulations, protocols, and many forms. She also has to get to know her coworkers, build a positive, supportive partnership with families, and plan for the children in her classroom where she must provide a safe, educational, and healthy environment. The average community-based program is spent two to five days onboarding new employees. We squeeze all this experience within the first few days. The statistics show that poorly designed onboarding leaves employees overwhelmed, confused, and frustrated. The studies show that the turnover rate in early childhood education field is about 30% with higher rates among those working in community-based organizations. Onboarding is a good opportunity to make long-lasting impressions on your new hires. That new lead teacher had arrived at my site. As a former site manager, I would have implemented my proven recommended protocol, which includes coaching sessions, teacher learning communities, and reflective supervision among other strategies. This protocol has led to 10 out of 11 employees that still working at the same agency 10 years later. Hi, Deanna. Thank you for your policy pitch and memo. I appreciate the way your memo outlines the challenges around onboarding and its connection to retention of staff. I also appreciate the experiences you bring to the pitch. I'm curious to know more about the selection of going in to focus in on a specific organization where there may be bigger policy levers that could look at fundamental shifts in paperwork and protocols at sites and possibly ease the burden of compliance on CBOs. I would have really loved to have heard the solutions outlined in your memo highlighted in the pitch, as I'd like to hear more about that cross-organization collaboration that you outlined and not just so focused in on the internal organization structures around onboarding and pre-boarding orientation in that, that frame. I'm wondering if there's space to consider the role of a local workforce alliance. These groups are bringing together organizations across a single sector to support the field. Chicago is launching one in early childhood and has a robust medical workforce alliance. This would allow CBOs to come together and learn from each other and engage non-CBO collaborators in a robust way to get needs across the sector met. I'd wanna look further into this before supporting the recommendation. Deanna, again, thank you for your work on this. I'm grateful to hear from such a dedicated early childhood leader, and I'm very proud of the environment you created that assured such strong retention of your staff. There are many lessons that we can learn from what, where we can learn from what you did. Also, thank you for bringing your memo and focus to children and families. Sometimes that gets lost when we talk about adults and workforce support. So thanks for keeping your eye on the goal. Well, thank you to both judges for their feedback and insights. Um, in response to the feedback, I want to say that I want to propose an onboarding that will focus on selecting center-based programs in the city of Chicago that are recipients of different funding streams, at least three different funding streams. The funders put a lot of pressure on community-based organizations to meet requirements and this becomes overwhelming for us. Um, my plan is that the funders will work together and develop an onboarding program that, they will, that will give employees a clear understanding of the requirements for each funding stream. The onboarding program will also give community-based organizations the opportunity to create a strategies to efficiently deliver high quality of services that result in meaningful outcomes for children. Regarding higher education, the funders will partner with higher education institutions to clear a clear blueprint for students in the early childhood programs. 
So the onboarding program will be created by the funders and it will be part of a class that their students might take before they finish their AA or their BA program. And community-based organization um, staff will teach the class and really give a students a real sense of what it means to work in a community in the community based organization. Thank you. Okay, so let's hear from the audience. Yes, no, maybe. And Deanna, we have a question from the chat from Catherine. Hey, Catherine. Would teachers that have several funding streams receive onboarding in each one? This is a great idea, by the way. So the idea is the fundings will collaborate and have one tool. So all the funding streams, Head Start, Prevention Initiative, PFA, Child Care, those funders we will get them together in one room for a few months and have them develop one tool that will really help all staff in community-based organizations. Thank you, Deanna. All right, so now up next we have Noel. Hi everyone, um, I'm Noelle Norris and I am the Associate Director of Kids Above All, formerly Child Serve, um, and I also supervise their home visiting program. I know a kid named Max, and Max was born with Williams Syndrome. The condition affects his heart and his brain and his mother was told that he wouldn't make it to see his first birthday. At nine months old, Max and his mother enrolled in home visiting. The family's home visitor presented the idea of goal setting. Cognitive and language development were at the top of the mom's concerns, and the home visitor could assess that it was what mom was most worried about as well. Through home visiting, Max received individualized cognitive, gross motor, and language activities. According to the mom, the most meaningful impact of the home visitor parent child interaction was the ability the home visitor had to provide her with the support and assistance she needed to advocate for her son's growth and development. Max is now four years old and continues to thrive despite his deficits. You don't get outcomes like that without time. Time spent building relationships are imperative for home visiting programs to maintain parent engagement in order to facilitate academic success and enhance the parent's knowledge. Typically, five hours a day is spent on data entry for enrollment. One data system with one set of standards would minimize the time to one hour and 15 minutes. That's almost four additional families that could benefit from personal interaction and the supportive knowledge of the home visitor. Home visitors are passionate about their work. When they feel obligated to complete visits, there's forced overtime because they're making the visits happen, plus completing, pa completing paperwork and data entry. Consequently, if they end their day on time, families will not get the visits they so desperately need. Now imagine a child like Max not receiving his needed visits. That child becomes a failed statistic and so does the family. The family isn't prepared to deal with the medical, financial, and educational crisis. We are spending too much time duplicating a multitude of standards and shortchanging the parents who are already dealing with so many risk factors. Not to mention the parents we can't even reach due to time limitations. A streamlined data system is needed in Illinois. Hi, Noel. I'm in agreement that home visiting systems in Illinois would benefit from alignment. However, I feel that it is more than just a data entry alignment problem that we have. We need to align services and funding to ensure equitable access for families. Data is a necessary element to document the effectiveness of home visiting programs, and it's needed to advocate for increased funding. Ensuring that accurate, Disaggregated data is available at all times is an area where I see that home visiting systems across the state can improve upon. Streamlining services so that there is a shared data entry point for all home visiting programs that offer consistent services would eliminate redundancy in data entry for home visitors. 
And that's something we can, can and should consider. In your policy memo, you presented data entry as the barrier to providing services to parents. I would love to see more evidence-based research that supports data entry as a barrier to providing home visiting services. Additionally, I wonder if the reason home visitors are working after hours is solely because of data entry, or is it the fact that more parents are entering the workforce and not available during traditional nine to five hours for home visits. I'm in total support of home visiting programs. And I agree that as a state, we need to do better with aligning funding and services to ensure equitable access for families. I also agree that improvement is needed in data collection and alignment. However, I'm not convinced to support these recommendations solely based on data entry redundancy and home visitors working after hours without considering the other barriers. Barriers such as quality, access, equity, funding, and community and domestic violence, all which prevents parents from receiving services as well. In order for me to support your recommendation, I would need to see more research-based information information that supports your problem. Um. You need to unmute. It's, it's We can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, it was saying that my speaker wasn't working um, and I need to use another speaker. But I wanted to thank both uh, Carissa and Elliot for their feedback on my policy. Um, I also want to say that um, I am in agreement with uh, what the recommendations that Carissa um, laid out for me. Um, they it's not just um, the multiple data systems. It is also the streamlining of services um, and requirements that needs to happen across the state of Illinois. Um, I chose to speak about the issue of data systems because I see the time wasted. I see it every day. Um, I see my staff um, suffering from it, um, not being able to make the connections with their parents that they want to make. Um, and the outcome measures not being reached because of the duplicate data entry um, and the time that it's taking away from the building of the relationships um, between the home visitor and the family and also the support that the home visitor can give to the um, parent-child interaction. And um, it is not only solo, solely data entry that um, takes away from those relationships. And I know that home visitors adjust their schedules to accommodate working parents um, so that they lessen the risk of overtime, even though it does still occur. Um, these schedules are usually plan planned in advance. Using one data system and streamlining services, um, I think can work hand in hand. And so it can happen simultaneously. Um, it will take a partnership of minds to come together and decide on what these streamlined services requirements will be. Um, I would like to talk about McVee. McVee's standards and, and services and requirements seem to be the quickest in responding to the needs of the families that we serve. Their standards promote high quality individualized intervention and many programs funded. Um, Elliot mentioned the, the, that the funding was blended and, um, and maybe even um, having one streamlined funding um, system, but I don't think that that would work. Um, a lot of programs function on blended funding um, and experience the high needs and risk factors um, in their communities. And if it wasn't for the multiple funds, groups would not, the, the achievement gap um, amongst most of them, all of these groups would widen and not close. And we don't want that. Um, I will revise my solution though, to include a plan um, for the Home Visiting Task Force, Illinois, Governor's Office of Early Childhood, um, ISB, McVie, all to decide on a set of standards and requirements. 
um, that can be put into one data system. And with doing my policy and all of my research, I found that that is happening now. Um, there is a subcommittee of the Home Visiting Task Force that is working on trying to streamline data. So I'm excited to see what comes from that. Thank you, Noelle. Okay, can we get the audience to vote? Remember that you can find the voting buttons under the participants tab. You can vote yes, no, or take a break. You click the more button to see, to find the little coffee mug for take a break is a maybe. That's what we're using to tally. So yes, no, or maybe. And Noelle, we have a question from Madeline. Uh, she's asking, are there technology supports that could help with data entry? Are there administrative changes within organizations or across funding streams that could reduce overtime and data entry? And I've got the timer going. Um, so to answer your question, there is a data system that McV uses um, that provides an immense amount of um, of, of technical assistance. And I think it's because they have a small number of staff that work um, for their company. So yes, that does already exist. And can you repeat there, a, it's a two part question. Yes, are there administrative changes within organizations or across funding streams that could reduce over time and data entry? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think if we were to revamp the way that the funds are allocated, um, then that's something we could possibly look at, but I don't think so. Thanks, Noelle. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's bring Nina to the stage. Hello, my name is Nina Smith and I'm executive director of the nonprofit LEAP. Have you ever had a job that you were invested in and had every intention to do well, but in the end, you didn't have the resources and training you needed? I imagine this might be the experience of licensed family child care providers when navigating quality improvement systems that were not designed with them in mind. Measuring and improving quality for licensed family child care remains a glaring issue within the early childhood workforce. There are not enough policies and procedures in place to support quality improvement for family child care. This means there are thousands of providers caring for tens of thousands of children between the ages of zero and five in Illinois who are left unsupported when it comes to determining and improving the quality of their services. We all know the significance of a child's early experiences on school readiness and academic achievement. In Illinois, the platform Accelerate Illinois used to promote quality among childcare awards ranked circles of quality. Given the differences in service delivery, family child care providers encounter challenges in meeting the criteria to achieve circles of quality beyond licensure. One emerging policy proposal for improving licensed family child care quality is utilizing home visiting models. Home visiting models support child well-being parent needs, and facilitating language and cognitive development. All of these are areas relevant to supporting quality for family child care. In pilots outside of Illinois, home visitors support providers by coming to their location, learning firsthand about their needs, and observing strengths of family child care. As Accelerate Illinois continues to undergo improvement of its framework, developing a pilot home visiting network to partner with family child care businesses could provide a structure that can be adopted to support family child care quality improvement, outcomes, and research. Thank you. Hello, Nina. I really appreciated your policy pitch. Um, I certainly feel like I can support your recommendation to consider using a home visiting model to support family child care providers by conducting regular visits, building relationships with providers, learning about their needs and observing strengths. I think the challenge is that with home visiting in Illinois, it's funded through a complex combination of federal and state funds with varying eligibility and program requirements requiring at least statewide administrative changes in order to extend the use of the various funding streams uh, to home-based childcare providers. 
I think I would have um, enjoyed if you'd exploit, er, ex, explored, excuse me, um, how we might delve into making that a possibility uh, within your pitch. Um, it is worth noting that the Illinois um, Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies currently have infant, toddler, and quality specialists that work with licensed family child care providers as well as health and safety coaches um, that support license exempt home based providers. So we already do have a network of professionals that do support these providers, but not quite to the extent to which you described in your proposal. Uh, it is possible that this group of professionals, though, could do the intense work outlined in the proposal. However, the CCRNR system, which is funded through the Illinois uh, Department of Human Services with child care development block grant funds and state GRE, could, um, could in fact make a, make a determination that this would be worthwhile uh, and change some of the deliverables expected with these positions. Um, I think that the work to implement this policy proposal would absolutely be worth the return as the ability to deliver intensive relationship-based services to support and enhance quality for home-based child care providers would have a tremendous impact on children and families in our state. So thank you very much to the judges for providing um, the constructive and rich feedback on my policy. Um, I would like to uh, summarize the general feedback I received was around funding sources as well as who will do this work. Um, I would like to mention that although uh, there are barriers presented um, to family child care providers getting circles of quality, the tool was designed with family child care providers in mind um, in the sense of being part of the planning. And so I think that applying home visitors um, as a pilot could first be explored by turning this over um, and beginning the discussion possibly with the Home Visiting Task Force Committee on the Illinois Early Learning Council. Um, their vision uh, includes incorporating innovative strategies for using home vis visiting service delivery um, in order to create equity-driven structural changes. So I believe that this might be something that they could continue the conversation around with regard to the funding streams, recognizing the complexity around that. Also, I received feedback around the, given the variability of home uh, family child care, the idea that home visiting, even if it turned out to be a feasible model in order to improve quality would not be enough given the variability and the amount of family child care providers in Illinois. So perhaps this could be a tool that is utilized in combination with family child care networks, as well as networks of child care centers that invite family child care providers in um, to receive those kinds of services. In addition, the utilization of infant specialists and quality specialists could possibly have their deliverables and roles expanded, um, looking at how the Illinois Child Care and Development Fund allows for some um, combination of funding under certain, certain circumstances. Perhaps administratively, we could look at, is there a way to include the spe special circumstance of quality improvement for home-based child care in that um, qualification for when you can combine funds for that role? Thank you. All right, so let's get the audience to vote yes, no, or maybe. And again, maybe is uh, the coffee mug, take a break option that you see there. Okay, so we have a question for you, Nina. A licensed FCC provider are entrepreneurial. Where is the support for the business side of, F of FCC programs? Yeah, so in the pilots where individuals did utilize home visiting models for quality improvement services, they had to undergo um, an additional amount of training to meet the differences in service requirements for working with family based child care providers. And this included not only learning about things like mixed age groups and working and supporting that development, but also how do you support um, a, a, a provider that is operating a business and reg, um, being compliant and what they have to file for and all those different pieces. So home visitors would actually have to become aware of those um, elements in order to support um, the, the family child care providers. Thank you, Nina. Okay, next to the stage, we've got Stephanie. Hi, 
Hi, can you hear me? Hello, my name is Stephanie Vine, and I'm with the Vice President of Programs at Cole Children's Center. Ms. Keyes teaches preschool children. She has a bachelor's degree in early childhood education and loves her students. Her classroom is bright and full of books and blocks and science materials to explore. But Mrs. Keyes doesn't feel comfortable teaching math in an interactive hands-on way. She relies on worksheets from an old curriculum and her students don't seem to enjoy math time and honestly, neither does she. Mrs. Keyes is one of many early childhood teachers who did not have a dedicated math methods course in her teacher preparation program. Like many adults in the United States, she has math anxiety, and research shows that math anxiety can be passed down from adults to children. In classrooms throughout Illinois, the main focus of instruction is on literacy, and literacy is very important, but it's not the only subject that should be taught. Today's early childhood classrooms do not have enough appropriate foundational math instruction, and this shows in assessment data. Only 33% of Illinois kindergarten students demonstrated math readiness on the 2018-19 kids assessment. And statewide, less than 32% of students in third through eighth grade met or exceeded math standards in 2019. This lack of instruction leads to students not being prepared to explore all career options. Imagine a future where every early childhood classroom, regardless of whether it's a preschool for all classroom, a Head Start program or a family child care program, has a teacher who is both competent and confident in teaching foundational math. A classroom where young children engage in measuring and counting and sorting and predicting, comparing and organizing data on charts and graphs. A classroom where children feel excited and empowered to learn math. A statewide effort to provide professional development and foundational mathematics will lead to early childhood teachers who will break the cycle in math of math anxiety and prepare young children, regardless of family income or early childhood setting, to demonstrate math proficiency. Imagine a future where test scores don't just improve, but where Illinois students are prepared to explore all career options, including careers in math and the sciences. Hello, Stephanie. Um, it is my pleasure to be able to serve as a judge for you in terms of your policy memo and two minute presentation. You are um, such a strong writer. I really liked your policy memo. Um, it's close to my heart, the importance of professional development and the need for um, greater consistency of content uh, in terms of early math. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. You did a great job of identifying um, what the issues were and collecting your data in support of your argument. So your evidence was quite convincing. Your um, uh, steps of marshalling administrative um, change through state agencies like uh, ISBE and the Board of Higher Ed and INCRA um, was all very compelling. If there was anything missing, it was that it wasn't clear that you had thought of other solutions before making the final recommendations. So um, I'm not quite sure what those other solutions might be, but it's always a good idea to show that you've considered alternatives uh, before looking for administrative change in policy. Um, I would say that uh, uh, your memo was short and sweet and to the point, and a policymaker reading it would know exactly what it was that you wanted to see improved. Um, your presentation, I think you were trying to get in all that, the same detail, and I would just urge you to slow it down, make eye contact, focus a little bit more on telling a story, but um, just uh, it's really good and um, it just is gonna get better every time that you tell it. Uh, all in all, um, I'm eager to work with you to try to get those changes into policy. So um, thank you for bringing this to my attention. Thank you. First, thank you to Terry Talon and Carissa Hurley for being judges for my policy memo. I really appreciate it. Um, and I do agree with the uh, feedback that we need to consider all um, alternatives and solutions to the problem, including focusing on foundational pre-service coursework, um, professional development training, ongoing coaching and mentoring, 
collaborations with libraries and children's museums. Um, I hope that this beginning um, of an increased focus on foundational mathematics is part of a well-rounded, developmentally appropriate hands-on curriculum for young children. Um, as Ms. Hurley stated in her feedback, as children move from the classroom and interest areas, math is embedded throughout. And so what we want um, through math professional development is that to create that starting point where teachers can help um, notice those moments and really focus on math throughout the day so that each child has an enriching part of um, every day in the classroom. And to me, I think that beginning starts with professional development because we aren't really sure where everybody is coming from as far as what their previous training was. But then I do agree with Terry that we, did, we need to focus on other areas like making sure we have pre-service um, training for teachers coming into school. All right, let's uh, poll the audience. Sorry, yes? I'm not sure about that. That's Alexa trying to get in on this program. Um, yes, no, maybe. And we do have a question for you, Stephanie. I like that you covered the topic. Oh, it's moving, sorry. I like that you covered the topic from so many perspectives. What are the implications to racial equity for this work? Thanks, Tanya Bids. Thank you, Tanya, yes. Um, so I think um, this, is, this is key to racial equity. A lot of the, um, the, the children in our programs um, do not have access to higher, um, to, to job opportunities later. And so to make sure that um, all of our teachers, regardless of, of what kind of program they're teaching in or how they got into the field, so piggybacking off of what a lot of the other um, fellows have already talked about, making sure that everybody is prepared to, to teach and feels comfortable and confident teaching foundational mathematics will allow children of all backgrounds um, and in all programs to be able to explore higher um, employment in the sciences and mathematics. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, next up, we've got the dynamic duo, Kim and Katie. Okay. Hi, I'm Kim Nelson. I'm the executive director of early childhood for the Rockford Public Schools. And I'm Katie Cox, the Director of Early Learning and Educational Grants for the East Aurora School District. Any architect can tell you that when designing a building, it's critical that you begin underground with the foundation. Construction teams carefully select the materials and design the structure with consideration of the environment and the building's purpose. Leaders in education must think the same way. We need to begin underground and build up. Children in Illinois are in grave danger of academic failure. In 2019, our current system failed 63% of children who were not properly prepared to meet standards on Illinois' assessment of readiness. The impact is even greater for English language learners, students of color, students with learning differences, and those furthest from opportunity. Illinois has continually shown their commitment to early learning through the allocation of funding, increased early learning opportunities for all children, and targeted early intervention. However, we are not efficiently connecting these foundational efforts to our educational institutions and seeing the outcomes that we should expect, resulting in a fragile structure. Schools do not create achievement gaps. The gap opens before kindergarten and is consistent through the K-12 years. The challenge leaders face is learning begins at birth and our current accountability system starts in third grade. This is equivalent to not measuring a building's structural integrity until the third floor has been built. To address this concern, we recommend the Illinois State Board of Education require early learning indicators in local ESSA plans for districts providing elementary education. What gets measured gets accomplished. To guide leaders on how to leverage this critical time of learning and development, professional learning providers will need to offer targeted training to leaders. It is essential that superintendents and school board members understand that learning experiences children have before school entry provide the strong foundation that all future learning is built on. With this information, leaders will be in a position to strategically use early learning as a tool to meet state targets. 
For the children of Illinois to attain the goals the State Board of Education has issued, we must design an accountability system that builds a strong foundation to ensure a structure that will last a lifetime. Kim and Katie, great job. Your pitch was really crisp and well organized. I thought your architecture analogy really worked. You used it well to both set up the problem and then bringing it back later in the conclusion. So again, your pitch was really strong. Good work on that. The memo was also persuasive. I think you hit the really important points. The initial problem statement was definitely strong. I thought it might have been even stronger if you had moved up one of the arguments you make later, the fact that accountability is an important driver of behavior. That feels like a really key point and it could have been made earlier. In the memo, you talk about two really important ideas, the fact that accountability for the early years is important and the fact that schools need stronger capacity to be successful at instruction in the early years. You make a strong case for each of them. I think the memo would have been even more effective if you had taken a little more time explaining the relationship between those two ideas. Also, you happen to get a judge who knows a lot about ESSA, and there were a couple of places where your analysis of what the law does or what's possible under the law wasn't quite accurate. Overall, your framing of the problem was definitely correct and broadly stated your solution works, but some of the details of the law itself weren't quite right. You did do a strong job of identifying the right policy actor, the State Board of Education, and you proposed solutions that are within that actor's power. So this is definitely a feasible proposal and would be an interesting starting point for an administrative action. Overall, you chose an important issue, you made a thoughtful set of recommendations, and you included the right arguments for those recommendations. I can see myself supporting them. Congratulations on finishing the fellowship, and I hope you'll keep engaging in the policy process. Thank you, judges. We really appreciate your expertise and thoughtful feedback. In 2014, Illinois became the first state to include early childhood content and experiences in their principal preparation program. This is an excellent beginning to developing a leadership workforce with an understanding of early childhood. However, it can't stop there. It's critical that the state builds out structures for professional learning around child development, developmentally appropriate practices, quality measures in early learning and early learning systems, thus strengthening capacity in our current and new leaders as they engage in this important work. While understanding, it's important, account, while understanding is important, accountability is a strong driver of behavior change. By initiating these actions cooperatively, leaders will be better prepared to make a greater impact. We all understand what gets measured gets accomplished. By simultaneously holding districts accountable for early learning outcomes and giving them the information they need to make informed decisions, we are more likely to see an aligned system built on the understanding that learning begins at birth. As an example, let's look at the implementation of the KIDS survey. KIDS is an observational based survey given or that is given within 40 days of kindergarten beginning. It is intended to be implemented in a play-based environment. However, many kindergartens across our state are not play-based due to a lack of understanding. And while a local district could choose to use kids three times a year to inform instruction, many districts complete the assessment merely to be compliant. If leaders understood the early learning landscape and the value of the kids' data, they could use this to connect the early years to the K-12 system. Just merely having an accountability system that is inclusive of the early years without the professional learning will not allow for meaningful change, sustainability, and improved outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Katie and Kim. Uh, we're gonna ask the audience to vote at this time and we're gonna hold off on the questions in the interest of time um, and we can, allow ourselves to stay a little bit after for those who want to, you know, interact with the fellows a little bit after, but I want to um, ensure that we get out of here on time. Um, so with that, did everyone vote? Remember yes, no, and maybe take a break. All right. And next up, we have Carmen. Hello everybody, my name is Carmen Holly, and I'm a project manager with the Lurie Children's Hospital Center for Childhood Resilience. Chloe walks into her first day of preschool with her backpack, lunch, and endless excitement about what this day will bring. During morning meeting, 
Chloe's teacher notices some challenging behaviors. Chloe isn't expressing that she's in distress, but her teacher notices that she's having trouble regulating herself, following instructions, and she hit another student who accidentally took her crayon. Chloe's teacher responds by giving her a stern verbal correction. This sets Chloe into a full meltdown, kicking, screaming, and biting. A stern verbal correction seems like a likely response, but not necessarily a trauma-informed response. This interaction was the first of many between Chloe and her teacher. By the middle of the school year, Chloe's teacher felt ill-equipped to meet her needs. The teacher wasn't aware about Chloe's family history, and she didn't know that Chloe is one of 35 million children in the United States who have experienced at least one traumatic event. Many early childhood educators are likely to encounter children who have experienced trauma, and the behavioral manifestations associated with trauma exposure can be disruptive to the learning environment. These behaviors can have a negative effect on the teacher and the children who witness or are victims of those behaviors. Early childhood educators may experience high levels of burnout and stress, which can lead to a premature exit from the workforce at the very time that children need stable and consistent adult relationships. So how do we support this workforce? By providing an elevated in-service trauma-informed training and implementation support program that is regional, cohort-based, and focused on licensed child care facilities receiving funding through the Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP, and coordinated through the Illinois Department of Human Services. Implementing this training model elevates the profession and changes the life course of children exposed to early adversity because this workforce will have the attitudes, the knowledge and skills needed to create psychological and physical safety, teach emotion regulation and relationship development skills to children exposed to trauma. Hi, Cameron. I am Dr. Antoinette Taylor, and I have the privilege of going over the work that you have submitted for the Erickson Institute Policy and Leadership as a fellow. I, I'm very excited about the idea that you're look, thinking about trauma, especially in this day and age of, of COVID-19 and so much of the um, unrest, just to be honest, unrest that we've seen in our community over the past couple of weeks. This is very, very important. I'm going to jump straight into uh, your solution. Uh, I love that you talked about it being a legislative issue. Uh, and I do believe that our legislative body in Illinois is going to be thinking about that. So your short term solution, I just wanted to, to just give you something to think of. And I'm actually looking at my notes as I'm talking to you. Uh, you did mention the pyramid model, which has been piloted here in Illinois. Uh, I want you to think about the fact that that was a granted model that has been piloted. So programs were not required to spend money from their often, as they say, limited budgets in order to have this. So how, how might we be able to take what you're talking about and have it in a format, uh, either through a grant or in a way where it would not become financially burdensome to, to programs. I love the fact that you're situating it, you know, in INCRA and the Office of Early Childhood Development, but I didn't really hear any specific mention about school districts and how this would work with school districts. Obviously, we need our child care program and our community-based organizations um, to be included in this. But I just want us to be very mindful that as we, as we talk about early childhood education and care programs, that we include districts, we include parochial, perhaps, and then we also as well include our community-based and our Head Start program. Good luck, Carmen. Looking forward to seeing you in July. Bye-bye. First, I want to thank Dr. Antoinette Taylor and Jennifer Alexander for their thoughtful feedback around inclusion of other entities, such as school districts and community-based organizations and parochial, and their questions around funding and scalability. First, as it relates to expanding the initiative to include other entities. My policy memo recommended looking at the counties in our state where children are at higher risk for exposure to trauma and adversity and less access to mental health supports. We could look into the school districts and CBOs in these counties and where there was interest and capacity, these school districts and organizations with Preschool for All and Preschool for All expansion programs could opt into the pilot. Second, in thinking about this issue of scalability, this is the value of training early childhood educators that have their boots on the ground, 
rather than having an external party come in and provide mental health consultation. And while it is true that some children with trauma exposure will need a trained professional to provide mental health supports, for many children, a trauma-informed classroom setting with a trauma-informed teaching staff might be just what they need to build resilience and recover. This train-the-trainer model would allow the early childhood educators to create, sustain, and expand this new knowledge and skills into teaching practices, training new staff and community partners in an effort to create trauma-informed educational spaces for all children. Last, there's the question around funding. So we know that the State Board recently released the Early Childhood Block Grant Request for Proposals. And when we look at the grantees that, that will be given priority, there are those public or private, nonprofit and for-profit entities who offer services to the same population of children that are the, the focus of my policy memo. So this could be potentially a funding stream for this in innovation project. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, can we get the audience to vote yes, no, maybe? And we'll hold the questions until the end. All right, so let's move on to Leslie. Hi, my name is Leslie McKinley, and I'm the Deputy Chief with the Office of Early Childhood at Chicago Public Schools. Let me introduce you to one of my most memorable students during my first year of teaching. We'll call her Victoria. I remember her so vividly because of her circumstances and my lack of understanding and training to look past her behavior. Victoria was a very sweet girl, but she would often become withdrawn and aggressive. And like many students that exhibit her behavior was labeled bad rather than a child who was experiencing trauma and needing intervention support. It turns out that Victoria was experiencing and witnessing trauma in her home at the hands of her mom's boyfriend. Victoria's story stuck with me over the years, not because her story was so unique, but because I have learned how common her story really is. Victoria, along with approximately 35 million young children, have been exposed to one or more types of adverse childhood experiences. 60% of children exposed to domestic violence are infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Research has also shown that there's a direct correlation between the amount of ACEs a child experiences and chronic health problems. Children experiencing four or more ACEs are over 1,200% more likely to attempt suicide. Most school staff, particularly administrators, lack training to create a school culture which recognizes and supports students with trauma, which means children like Victoria are often mislabeled. I'm recommending elementary school principals are trained in recognizing and addressing trauma in young children. Governor Pritzker signed a resolution declaring May 15, 2019 as the state's first trauma-informed awareness day, which is a great first step. However, we need a policy mandating administrators enroll in a two-day statewide training focused on evidence-based trauma-informed practices. Illinois would then be able to develop a school culture statewide that would equip administrators with the knowledge to support the whole child as a part of a healing-centered approach to create a successful, long life for children and families. Thank you. Good morning, Leslie. This is Dr. Taylor, and I am so excited to have the opportunity to be able to uh, give you some feedback on your, your work that you have submitted for Erickson Institute Policy and Leadership. Um, I, I want to be clear and transparent here. Years and years and years ago, I worked with you as actually as a consultant with CPS when um, many, many years ago when they were doing their special interest group, that's where you and I first met. So I'm so happy to see where you are now in your career and, and the look that you, are, you have on administrative support for students in the early learning years, because I do agree with everything that you said and that oftentimes administrators are thrust into this point of work and they don't necessarily have all the tools that they need for no fault of their own. They don't have all the tools that they need in order to be able to really understand early childhood. So I'm excited to see that you are 
referencing that as your focal point. Um, I, I want to let you know uh, that your solution is one that I agree with. I definitely think that there needs to be, as you put it, uh, building the awareness of school and district leadership through training and professional development. I, I wonder for you, is this a higher ed issue as well? Because in fact, as you said several, several times, we have administrators that come into early childhood without this knowledge. And that means that they are possibly, as you said, earning their credentials and they are not required to, to learn about trauma, ACEs, early childhood. So I think that's one thing I would like for you to just to consider and, and talk about a little bit more. Is this also a higher ed issue? And if it is, how could you respond to that? And the rest I'll put in writing. Good luck, Leslie. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Um, I'm very encouraged by the feedback, both from Dr. Taylor and Terry Talon, which was similar and pointed to linkages to higher education. Um, their response helped me to enhance my focus and to clarify additional avenues to support the goal of ensuring both new and existing administrators are provided with the knowledge and leadership skills for early childhood and early childhood trauma. In addition, their feedback also caused me to define whether my ask was for administrative changes or legislative changes. Um, and the response is both with a twofold approach. So for existing principles, it is administration. Um, the work is geared towards identifying ways for principals to gain that knowledge and skills through job embedded, professional development, and continuing education hours. Um, for new principals, it's legislative and it requires working with the higher ed institutions and adding pre-service requirements. Um, for both categories of administrators, um, we need support and to work with um, ISBE uh, to update licensing requirements and work with um, higher ed to ensure program requirements are part of the core curriculum and continuing education process. As principals are the lever change in schools, I really wanted my uh, memo to utilize and um, take advantage of that lever and to focus my um, policy on their preparedness for ECE and ECE trauma. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Can we get the audience to vote, please? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> All right. And while they vote, we're going to bring Ashley to the stage. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Nazarek and I'm the Vice President of Learning and Evaluation Department for the YMCA of Metropolitan Chicago. Today I'm going to tell you the story of Ms. Woods. Ms. Woods has been an educator for 22 years. She lives in and is a part of the community where she also works. Her organization operates Head Start programming. She's an assistant teacher. Much more importantly, Ms. Woods is known for her thoughtful approach with children and families. She's beloved by the entire school community. Ms. Woods is an educator of color, which means she represents the cultural and linguistic backgrounds of many of the children and families served. For years, Ms. Woods only received basic training to meet program mandates. Recently, though, she was invited by her program director to join a data use task force at her site. She's also in an accelerated BA licensure evening program and has been sent to an influx of trainings held by city agencies. After Ms. Woods obtains her BA, she decides to leave the center. The negative impact on children and families in her classroom is enormous. The lead teacher role is also vacant and a revolving door of staff come in and out of the room to maintain ratios. Children are stressed and anxious, parents are too. This story isn't unique. Ms. Woods is like 42% of the workforce that turns over regularly, disrupting caregiver-child relationships and the impact of ECE programs. The many well-intended workforce development in initiatives often appear fragmented to frontline educators. An incredible amount of work has been done to invest in pathways and pipelines to BA attainment. And currently, there are recommendations that outline how to ensure a more integrated professional learning system. 
In order to maximize these recommendations, I propose three amended changes. A pilot phase focused on community-based organizational buy-in and ownership, expansion of in-service professional development to include accelerate continuous improvement practices that count toward licensure, and community collaborations focused on measurably boosting kindergarten readiness within an existing professional learning system aimed at supporting educators and increasing quality practice comprehensively. If Ms. Woods had been a part of a coordinated professional learning system that honored her experiences, the children and families would still be benefiting from her teaching, and the impact, instead of broken, would be maximized. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to see your policy pitch and read your brief. Um, you had me at the opening narrative. I can't tell you how much I was grabbed by you actually putting a name and a person to that 42% of early childhood educators that constantly um, are turning over. Um, I also think that you drew a line that's really powerful too and thinking about that there's a possible connection between increased educational requirements and folks getting those requirements and turnover. And then you segue into this great solution, which is we can mitigate this problem if there's increased coordination and collaboration among the agencies and organizations and higher ed programs. Simply put, don't leave you all out, you know, and I think that that's really important. And you you go ahead and hit right on the holy grail of high, of high quality adult ed, which is embedded and aligned with the day-to-day -day work context. I think what I would add to, you, to this is to really think about when you're outlining your steps, uh, what your recommendations to be, is to think the role of, it's not necessarily policy or legislative, but there is a role for state agency in creating the right incentives, whether these are financial incentives or other types of incentive, incentives for higher ed to collaborate directly with agencies and see that we need to do exactly what you describe, be co-designers of the educational experience. And this, I think these incentives such as the Grow Your Own and residency programs are kind of already out there, but what they really need to do is build and connect to include community-based organizations. Thank you judges for your comments and your feedback. Um, one of the themes that was throughout your comments was around cost and how to really uh, include state agencies. Understanding the most cost effective way to implement the recommended professional learning system changes outlined in my policy memo will require both an examination of current budget allocations for PD and existing funding channels and an analysis of the gaps of the overall system. For example, incentives for higher ed and appropriate infrastructure building. In the long term, I do envision a follow-up policy recommendation with expli explicit budgetary guidance. However, in the immediate, there are three models that can aid in unpacking how much of, of it will cost to develop a comprehensive e e ECE professional learning system. First, as mentioned, the Grow Your, your Own cohort models. There are several past uh, designs to look to, as well as those recently funded by an IBHE grant geared towards the development of cohorts designed to increase the number of ECE credentials and endorsements in the state of Illinois. Second, the Child Care Funding Accelerate Pilot, which provides new dollars through the preschool development grant to examine center-based infrastructure in the form of staff time, qualifications, and salaries. And third, organization, organizations funded by private philanthropy to embed ongoing professional learning in their system. In the first step of my policy memo, I outline the need to focus on capacity building. I recommend a component of this should be that each existing initiative complete a fiscal analysis and lessons learned report that's shared across the broader field. Secondarily, an interagency cross-sector convening needs to occur. Pilots would then inform a more comprehensive professional learning system instead of people dependent models at scale. Notably, we must shift from the idea of scaling a single initiative to building replicable professional learning models that are intentionally integrated and transparently shared at the systems level. The Stone Foundation has given dollars to convene a table of tables. I encourage participants in this work group to consider developing relationships with CBOs to create educator partners, which, which would then represent the diversity and experience of current educators. 
Thank you, Ashley. And there was a request to see Baby Frankie, but I don't know if Baby Frankie is <laughs> available or not. But at this point, um, we're going to uh, pass it over to Christina to take us out. All right, everyone. I uh, would like to connect us just to the last, the closing slides. Um, and if, if people want to stay on a little bit longer for some um, Q&A for the fellows that were not able to. Um, I'm sorry. One time, I'm sorry to interrupt. We didn't vote for Ashley. Please let's oh. vote for Ashley. Yes, no, or maybe. That's very important. Yes, that's right. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, bearing witness to the amazing ideation research uh, debate that went over uh, a period of 10 months. Um, the fellows certainly were amazing in terms of their persistence and endurance to not only go through this exercise as all fellows in the past have um, and, and stress out at some point and um, you know, have some moments of despair, but to do that during a pandemic. I really do want to um, commend them for following through, for staying the course, for continuing to um, push ahead and forge ahead. I think it's really a testament. These are incredibly abnormal times. And then when you throw in everything that is happening with respect to racial injustice, I mean, there's so much going on. And I think it's an amazing, um, again, testament to their will, their persistence, their commitment to the work. Um, they truly are soldiers in this uh, revolutionary work for the babies. Um, I always talk about the revolution will not be televised because it will be starting with infants and toddlers. And um, these are our generals in the fight. Um, and I am really just honored to have spent the past 10 months with them um, in close communication. And we will continue to work with our fellows. Um, everyone who has registered for this webinar probably received a communication from um, our team at the beginning of the week um, with us kind of announcing what our focus is going to be for this next fiscal year due to the many unknowns that um, are are difficult to account for at this moment in time we are not um, we're delaying the uh, introduction of a new cohort um, of Barbara Bowman Leadership Fellows, as well as a new cohort of the McCormick Foundation Executive Fellows. In fact, we are doubling down on our alumni base um, for a variety of reasons. We wanna ensure that they have the support that they need to be able to lead in these very uncertain and volatile times. Uh, we really want to be able to operationalize these recommendations um, that they have spent so much time um, meticulously constructing and um, also to really digest the feedback from our expert judges to figure out how can we move this forward. It was a very deliberate um, decision to focus on the workforce um, in this particular cohort. Uh, any of anyone else who has participated in our policy pitch noted, probably noted that, you know, this is a little bit of a departure because we have always had a variety of topics and we decided to narrow in because this is the number one issue facing our field today. The topic of the workforce is a social justice issue. And what Erickson's business is about is definitely preparing the workforce and advocating for the workforce. And we wanted to just really go deep on that because this is the work of many dedicated individuals, predominantly women, women of color, immigrant women, and therefore it is incredibly necessary that we do what we can to advance the field, to deserve, to, to get the professional recognition, the compensation, and um, ultimately to be safeguarded. Um, the 
as we know, early childhood touches every single sector. And so I think it's incredibly important um, that we created this marketplace of ideas so that we can really put our best um, ideas forward and try to advance them. And so I will close this out. There's just two points I want to make um, to make sure that everybody is aware of that um, in this space. And the first is, you know, you all have probably heard us um, share this out before, but Policy and Leadership has an app. You can download it for free from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Um, and that's the best way to stay in touch with everything that we are doing in Policy and Leadership. You can dive deep into the Early Childhood Leadership Academy. You can look at our community data lab work with the Early Development Instrument and the Risk and Reach Report, um, as well as our um, Chicago Risk Factor data. You can um, understand and, and connect with fellows in our alumni network, um, but you will be able to ultimately access these policy memos as well as the videos as well as the judges responses through the app through our website um, ericsson.edu on the um, early childhood leadership academy webpage, as well as anyone who registered for this um, event will get a follow-up email with links to this information just to address a question that was asked about data um, and, and two different statistics that were cited about turnover um, I would just recommend looking at the original um, policy memos and the sources that were cited so that that can be sort of reconciled and that'll all be included in the links the last piece again I just want to um, really shout out everyone whose fingerprints were a part of this particular um, cohort. Everyone from the policy and leadership team, you know, the ECLA team is an incredibly lean and mean team of two, <laughs> but um, everyone on staff uh, throws throws their um, hands on deck and, and gets down with it. And I think it's it's incredibly important to acknowledge that. I also want to thank the coaches for their time and dedication, um, as well as our copy editor and our feasibility coaches. I'd like to thank all of the presenters and partners that contributed to the content, many of whom are on the call with us today. And then I last but not least, want to honor Barbara Bowman, who is our namesake, and um, we are all her living legacy. And finally, you know, as I mentioned before, the funders who came together to make this program possible. So with that, I will stop sharing the screen. Um, I know that we have some pieces in the um, in the chat, I don't know if there is time, if we want to answer perhaps a couple more questions. Um, Penny, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, there were a couple of questions that came up for the, but I know Ashley's got to go, but one of the things that we are going to do, include in, we're going to include in the follow-up email for those of you who registered, is um, access to the feedback of all the judges because as as Christina said at the beginning we were not able to play all of the responses you will also get an opportunity to rate the both the policy memo and the pitch yourself by using the same uh, scoring uh, form that the judges used so we'd love to hear your feedback on that because this is not something that's just going to stop here these are recommendations that we fully support our fellows and we are looking for all the barriers that we need to overcome in order to push this through. Um, so look out for that. You'll see uh, either on YouTube or uh, Vimeo or both and or um, we will post these videos so that you can see their pitches um, and all the judges responses as well. And thank you again to the judges. Thank you so much. Thank you, judges. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think with that, we will sign out because I think for the most part, our questions had been um, more or less fielded, but let's keep the dialogue going. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm so glad to hear that you are ending on a positive note with us. That warms our hearts. Thank you, everyone, for Thanks, your everybody. time and attention. Take care.